Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Today, we are going to study on the two books from the Minor Prophets, that is Amos and Prophet Obadiah. So even before we could begin with our session, can I request one of us to lead us in prayer, please? Sid, can you lead us in prayer? Thanks. Yes, ma'am, I was about to raise my hand. <laughs> Good. Father, we come to the throne of grace. Thank you for this time, Lord, you have given us as we are going to learn about Lord, your prophet book, about, about the books of the prophet, Lord. Whatever they have done, Lord, whatever the example they were before this red light, Lord, let their anointing be a sign upon us, Lord. Whatever they have done, Lord, whatever the work they have given for the kingdom, Lord, for the kingdom especially, Lord, let there be a percentage of their work in our lives also, Lord. As we are going to study, Lord, whatever we will be studying, Lord, <coughs> Saturn, Saturn should not drop us of that knowledge, Lord. As we are working, Lord, as we are studying about your kingdom, Lord, whatever we are learning here, Lord, it should be used for the kingdom expansion. It should be, amen. Lord, your name will be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Welcome again. Let me share the slide. I guess most of the subjects, they are completing the portion, isn't it? When we should be completing the Old Testament survey soon. Yeah, I can see this, yeah. I hope you can see the presentation. Okay. Yes. yes, it's available now. So we're going to study on the book of Amos, <clears throat> Prophet Amos. Okay, there are some people still logging in. Let me accept them. One second, please. Okay, so Amos was the author of this book and uh, based on uh, Amos chapter 1 verse 1, we see that who lived during this time when Israel was divided into two kingdoms, that is the northern and the southern kingdom. And Amos was a shepherd and also a farmer of sycamore figs. He resided in the town of Teco. And so Amos was a shepherd and uh, being a farmer, he turned to be a prophet as well and where God used him to uh, to uh, to share the message to talk to the people of Israel about uh, you know he, he, he prophesied very boldly about the sin nature of Israelites you know very courageously he went and you know he rebuked the sin nature what the people were in and he was trying to visualize the nearness to God's judgment and um, you know he started mobilizing to the nation to repent the nation like the basket uh, he compared the nations like the uh, basket of the rotting fruit and uh, stands ripe for judgment because of its hypocrisy and spiritual difference well um, the name amos is derived from the hebrew root word called amos to lift a burden or to carry thus as per his name means burden bearer, Amos lived up to the meaning of his name. He actually bore the burden of this uh, of this nation, and he kept declaring the judgment toward the rebellious Israel. And this book, um, this book is uh, uh, this book is divided into the four divisions. Uh, let me present it to you. Okay, one second. I'm going back to the slides. Okay, totally there are about nine chapters and uh, the book is divided into three. Uh, yeah, not for three. The first talks about the series of messages and then there's a collection of poems, 
from uh, chapter seven to nine, we see uh, contains a series of visions. Visions of there are five visions listed. Uh, the vision of a locust. God sends sw a swan of locust that devastated Israel's crop. The outcome of that was Amos prays and God relents on sending judgment and then we see the vision of fire god sends fire that dries up the water and devours israel's land and then we see again amos prays and god relents on sending judgment somebody has logged in i'll just accept them yeah then we see the vision of a plumb line god compares israel to a wall built true to plumb like God's people fail to meet his standards. And here we see when Amos prayed, God destroys Israel's high places and sanctuaries. And later we see the fourth vision, that is the basket of ripe fruit, where God declares that Israel is ripe for judgment. And God sends death, destruction, and darkness to Israel. And God refuses to answer his people. And the fifth, vision was the Lord by the altar. God tells Amos to strike the tops of the temple pillars and God destroys the Israelites who are crushed by the collapsing temple or killed by the sword. So these are the five visions that are covered from chapter 7 to 9. And there are some key verses here which we can study in this book saying that uh, two walk together unless they have agreed to do so and in uh, chapter 3, verse 7, talks about surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servant, the prophets, which he does even now among our myths. He always reveals things to us and then he does. Our God is a God, not a God of surprise, but then our God releases things among his people. He talks to us. Our God, who's, uh, our God is a God who has a relationship with his people. He shares things with us. And then Amos 5.24, we see a God is also a God of justice and righteousness. We see uh, let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like uh, a never failing stream. He is a God of righteous and justice. And Amos 9.15 says, I will plant Israel in their own land never again to be uprooted from the land I've given them, says the Lord our God. This is the promise that God gives us. No matter, uh, yes, he's correcting uh, for our sin and there are consequences that we need to face for our sin. But then God is a God of mercy and hope. Even though people were rebelling, they were not uh, heeding the voice of the prophet. But there's always a message of hope. We have been studying in every prophetic book. There is a message of hope that God will not give up Israel, no matter how rebellion they are. God is not ready to give up on them, but then he's trying to talk to them. He's trying to relate to them. He's trying to change them. He's trying. He's waiting for them to rep repent and turn back so that he may save them. So here God is saying that I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted. Now he's saying when people have been killed, destroyed, and then exile. And this is the time God is giving them a message of hope. Hey, listen, I will not leave you the way you are, but then I'm going to rest restore you back. There is a message of restoration to those who are seeking God, to those who are, uh, you know, waiting upon him and his promise. Because uh, there's a promise that God made to Abraham saying that I will bless you to be a, a mighty nation. I will bless uh, your nation. Your seed will be blessed. And also God uh, makes another covenant with David saying that uh, I will raise a king okay from your lineage so there is a promise that god made to david and god made to abraham god will keep the promise that he makes he's a promise keeper yeah uh, so with this uh, give me a minute please So with this, we will move on to the chapter-wise study. Um, 
chapter one to two. Chapter one to two, we we see that uh, this book opens with a series of short poems that accuses all of Israel's neighbor of their violence, injustice. And this is kind of odd because the book opening line says that Amos is going to speak against Israel. But we need to read this chapter to know how this works. So as uh, Amos uh, is naming all these neighboring nations around them, like Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Abnan, Moab, Edo, Judah, Israel, and all these nations are in the circle. And Israel lies right in the center like a target. And so on Israel, Amos is releasing a poetic accusation that like, you know, three times longer or more intense than any of the other. Here we see that he accuses Israel's wealth of ignoring the poor and allowing grave injustice in their land, especially by allowing the poor to be sold into um, debt slavery and then going on to deny any of these people legally representation, legal representation. And this way, Amos, is, <clears throat> Amos asks uh, these questions like, is this the family that was once denied justice and enslaved in Egypt? Is this the family that God rescued from oppression and slavery? And Amos is very annoyed with the very nature of people. And he's saying, everything is over. God is done putting up with you. And, uh, you know, he goes on with this uh, judgment on Judah, judgment on Israel. We see that in chapter two. And then he moves on to uh, chapter three to six. He explains why. Uh, can I request one of us to please turn to chapter three, verse two? Can anyone read? Sid, can you read? Shall I read? Yes, Dipya. Amos 3, verse 2, right, Pastor? Yes, yes. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, so we see that God is saying, I choose you, Israel, from among all the families of the earth. This is an allusion to Genesis 12, the promise that God made with Abraham, how God called him from the family of uh, to become God's blessing to all the nations. So then God says, um, below we see that, uh, so this is why I will punish you for all your sins. And Israel had a great calling which came with great responsibility. So it's not only for Israel, even today for you and me, that if there is a great call, there is a great responsibility that is placed on us that needs to be fulfilled. So we need to take in charge of that. So here we see uh, Israel uh, so that they sin and the rebellion brings great consequence as well. So now this chapter brings together a lot of Amos poems and we'll see a few key themes repeated over and over again. So he is constantly, Amos is constantly exposing the religious hypocrisy of Israel's wealth and their leaders. And he describes how they faithfully attended the religious gathering, giving offering and sacrifice to all uh, while neglecting the poor and ignoring injustice. And we also see Amos says, it's all a shame. It's all a sham. That is, you're just pretending. It's all a pretense that God actually hates they worship and he says it's totally disconnected from how they treat people and God says a real relationship with him will transform people's relationship a real relationship with God will transform people's or the person's relationship remember this the relationship that we have with God will transform how we relate ourselves to the people around us so Amos calls the true worship. Can I request one of us to please turn to chapter 5, verse 24 and read.
Amos chapter yes. 5, verse 24. 24. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. Amen. Amen. So what does it say? It says, let justice flow like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. Our God is a God of justice and righteousness. These two words, they are super important. They are very, very important to Amos. He actually calls, um, you know, all of the prophets. Very important. So righteousness in Hebrew. Let me turn to that slide, please. Yes. So here we see uh, righteousness in Hebrew means sedak refers to a standard of right equal equable relationships between people no matter their social differences and then we see the justice justice in hebrew means mishpa refers to concrete so actions that we take to correct injustice and create righteousness so both of these are to permeate the life of god's covenant people like a rushing stream filling uh, the dry riverbed. So next theme we see in Amos is a repeated accusation of Israel's idolatry. So remember, when the northern kingdom broke away from the southern kingdom, Judah, their kings built two temples to match up uh, with Solomon's uh, temple in Jerusalem. As we also, uh, we went through this in 1 Kings chapter 12, that uh, how the Israelites placed the golden calf in the temple. So since then, the Israel had only accumulated more idols. They perverted the temple. They perverted the very nature within them and with others. They worshipped the gods of sex, weather and war. They worship the, all the other gods of, um, you know, the Baal and the other uh, Canaanite god. And in the uh, uh, and in the prophet's view, the worship of these gods always led to injustice. Because these gods don't require the same degree of justice and righteousness as the god of Israel. But then these gods were immoral by themselves. So what kind of nature would come among the people who are worshipping these gods? So they can't be the same. And we be different. He is of high standard, high degree. A God of integrity, God of righteousness, God of justice. So we see in chapter 5 verse 4. <clears throat> Sorry. We see that. But thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live. So God says to Israel in one place, that is in 5, 4, chapter 5, verse 4, seek me and you shall live. And right after, below the passage in same chapter, chapter 5, verse 14, we see, seek good, not evil, that you may live. You see how important is our moral value, our integrity? Seek good, not evil, that you may live, that we may live in the land. So true worship of the Creator and uh, God of Israel is uh, like he's doing good with generosity, with justice. He is a God who's seeking justice and righteousness in us. So the final theme in these chapters is that because Israel and its king have rejected Amos and his prophecy, and also at the same time, the other prophets as well. So God sends the day. God will uh, send a day, a day of the Lord. So here he's talking about the great day. The judgment day. This is the great and terrible uh, act of justice on Israel. So specifically, Amos predicts that a powerful nation will come and conquer and decimate the cities and take the people away into exile. And we know his prediction came true. Same, 40 years later, what happened? The Assyrians, the Assyrian Empire, 
came and swooped in and did exactly what Amos had prophesied. So we see in chapter 7, chapter 7 to chapter 9, we see that the book closes with a series of visions that Amos has experienced and their symbolic depiction of the coming day of the Lord as we went through. So he sees Israel being devastated with a, a, a locust swan and then by a scorching fire and then they have been swallowed up like overripe fruits. And in the final vision, Amos sees God violently striking the pillars of Israel's great idol temple at Bethel. And the whole building comes crumbling down. It's an image of God's justice on the leaders and the God of Israel. Their end has finally come. But then, all of a sudden, in the final chapter, that is chapter 9, verse 11 to 15, can I request one of us to please read? Sid, you there? Miss, can I read in NLT yeah. version? Yes, please go ahead. Verse 11. In that day, I will restore the fallen house of David. I will repair its damaged walls. From the ruins, I will rebuild it and restore its former glory. And Israel will possess what is left of Edom and all the nations I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken and he will do these things. The time, the time will come, says the Lord, when the grain and grapes will grow faster than they can be harvested. Then the terraced vineyards on the hills of Israel will drip with sweet wine. I will bring my exiled people of Israel back from distant lands and they will rebuild their ruined cities and live in them again. They will plant vineyards and gardens. They will eat their crops and drink their wine. I will firmly plant them there in their own land. They will never again be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Amen. 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 Out of all this, what the Israel has done, you know, out of all what the Israel has done, see, you see, still we see the message of hope. How amazing our God is, God of restoration. That's why he's called of God of restoration, God of rebuilding, God of second chance. God never gives up. Tell me, from the day we have seen the formation of Israel till now, continuously people are rebelling against God. Though they all have the Torah, they read through the Torah, but then, because they have been perverted in nature, they got mixed up with the other people. They are not able to seek God in his word. They are not able to discern that God, the God of Israel is the true God. They went behind the other gods, which, you know, which, uh, uh, which were there in the, in the land. And here we see the message of hope that it picks up this image of Israel as a destroying a destroyed building and God says that out of the ruins he will one day restore the house of David in other words he's going to bring the future messianic king from David's line and then he will rebuild this family of God's people which surprisingly they are told and is going to include the people from all the nations and all of the devastation caused by Israel's sin and God's judgment will that day be reversed. Now, this final paragraph is very, very important. It says it's the only sign of hope on the other side of judgment. And it helps us to see how this book is going to explore the relationship between God's justice and his mercy. Well, if God is good, he has to confront judge evil among Israel and the nations. But his long-term purpose are to restore the world 
and build a new covenant family build the relationship with his people so through the book of amos we see that uh, you know amos words uh, still today we hear this call to learn from israel's hypocrisy and disaster and to embrace the true worship of god which should always lead us into the justice and righteousness and loving our neighbors that's what the book of Amos is all about. And here we see the portrayal of Christ in this book, where it clearly, uh, the clearest anticipation of Christ in Amos is found at the end of the book, that he has all authority to judge. But he will also restore his people. So through Christ, we have been restored, not only Israel, but everyone. Everyone who believes in Jesus will have eternal life. That's what the New Testament says, because he died on the cross. He came into this world to save us, to redeem us and restore us back to him so that we will have eternal life. The salvation is a free gift that we can have through Jesus Christ. So how do we apply this book into our life? Well, we see that injustice permeates our world. Yet, as Christians, we often turn the blind eyes to the suffering of others for more important like work like praying, preaching and teaching. But the book of Amos reminds us that those works Yes, needed. But while, uh, you know, um, for believers, for us, which we think is, uh, you know, uh, when we think like we allow, we don't love and serve others in our own lives. And we find ourselves falling into the trap of time, like prioritizing between his prayer important or service. Which is more important? How do we serve? How do we pray? Should we choose any one thing? Well, the book of Amos says we should do both. Both are important. Both are equally important. We need to pray at the same time. We need to serve others. It is more essential. <clears throat> because God has called Christians not only... Sorry. <clears throat> Just clearing my throat. So God has called the Chris Christians not only to be in relationship with God, but also to be in relationship with others. It is equally important. The relationship that what we have with God, we can see it permeate from us, okay, where we cannot contain that love to ourselves, but then to love others, love neighbors as ourselves. That is one of the command which Jesus gave to us in New Testament saying that love your neighbor as yourself. Where both the physical and the spiritual needs of people matter in God's justice. Well, with this, do you all have any questions? We end this book of Amos and we can move on to the other book. But if there's anything that you would like to share, add, please go ahead. Okay. Okay, so it's all clear. <clears throat> Sorry. So we can uh, move on uh, to the next book, the book of Obadiah. Let me change the slide. Yeah. Okay, the book of Obadiah. So this is a very uh, short book in the whole of uh, uh, Old Testament. We see it has only one chapter with 21 verses. So it is a series of divine judgment poems against the ancient people of Edo. Now, uh, which was a nation that uh, neighbored Israel on the other side of the Dead Sea. So first, we see the backstory of this place. The people of Edom were very unique because they had shared an ancestry with Israel. They both belonged to the same family. Well, we all know Abraham. Abraham had a son, Isaac, and Isaac had twins, the two sons. Who were they? Jacob and Esau. Now, 
when we look at the book of genesis it tells us the story of these two brothers where they uh, they always had a tension in their relationship they were not very good terms but later part we see how uh, jacob uh, you know changed himself he realized his mistake then uh, he says i will go and reconcile with my brother yes he came back he reconciled with his brother on certain ground but then the descendants of esau were called as edomites edom and the descendants of jacob were called as israelites now we know the story so uh, though the brothers reconciled okay but then their descendants always had a tension within them the tension which were there with the brothers actually carried on carried on among the families and not only then even in centuries it started and still it is the same and it's that bond that betrayed and shattered in the tragic event of israel's fall to babylon so when israel was invaded and conquered by the babylon the people of edom who was the neighboring took advantage of a uh, plundering our uh, israel cities instead of being there to help them they took this as an opportunity when the time came for babylon to conquer israel instead of helping the israelites they joined and they took this uh, situation as an opportunity to plunder the israel uh, israel cities and then capturing the israelites and even uh, they went to an extent of killing the israelites refugees this was not right in the sight of god so we'll see what obada how god speaks through obadiah to edomites obadiah's a name meaning worshipper of yahweh offers an interesting counterpoint to the message of judgment he pronounced on edom so judah's neighbor toward the southeast as a worshipper of god ya or yabe obadaya placed himself in a position of humility before the lord he also embraced his lowly place before the almighty god that god sent a man named worshipper of yabe to the people of edom and uh, it was not a mistake because edom has been found guilty of pride before the lord we see that in uh, obadiah chapter 1 verse 3 can i request one of us to read please obadiah chapter 1 verse 3 you have been deceived by your own pride because you live in a rock fortress and make your home high in the mountains who can ever reach us way up here you ask boastfully thank you thank you so we see that uh, you know they thought themselves much greater they actually were so great enough to mock steal from and even harm god's chosen people but then the lord god uh, you know who named obadiah used to stress god's sovereign power over this nation and he says that i will i will not uh, i will not see my people suffer forever and uh, through obadiah god reminded edom you no know, uh, obadiah is talking to the edomites saying that of their poor treatment toward the people of israel we see that in verse 12 to 14 we see that but you should not have gazed on the day of your brother when the babylonians came to attack israel they should not have just watched them go and plunder them but then they should have been there to help them instead of helping them they also took part in their you know took an opportunity to kill steal and destroy our people so your god is saying that in the day of his captivity nor should you have rejoiced over the children of juda so in the day of their destruction nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress 13 he says you should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity indeed you should not have gazed on their affliction so in the day of their calamity nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity now you should not have stood at the cross roads to cut off the, those among them who escaped nor should you have delivered up those among them 
who remained the days of distress. You know, so the uh, so God is promising uh, a redemption to Israelites, but not to the Edomites. Yes, yes, he is concerned about Israel and Judah, but then not with Edomites. The nation of Edom, which eventually, uh, you know, when we look back in the history, it's eventually disappeared into history. It remains one of the prime example of, uh, you know, uh, uh, which goes like this in Proverbs 16, 18, which says, pride goes before destruction. Pride goes before destruction or pride goes before fall. So this is what happened to Edomites. They were they were very proud about their strength and they rejoiced over the destruction of Israel. But then there is a God who will restore Israel. They never saw that. Not they have never thought about that. But then their pride brought their own fall. In uh, verse 16 to 21, we see where Obadiah announces the day of the Lord, but not only for Edom. He also widens his focus to all the neighboring nations. He says, some, uh, you know, y'all also, you also could have helped Israel, but then you rejoiced over them. So Obadiah says that all prideful nation, the very act, just like how Edomites behaved, uh, on the uh, on the face of God's justice, in the same way they will also fall, for their prideful heights will come to ruin. He wants the Edom and the neighboring nations as well. But as in all the prophets, we see God's judgment is never his final word. Especially remember the conclusion of these two books the, uh, that came right before Obadiah was Joel and Amos, which we studied yesterday. Well, in Joel chapter 2 and 3, uh, uh, Joel said, he, he, he created a picture of what will happen after the day of the Lord against all nations. Well, he also said that God would perform a new act of salvation in Jerusalem and all, and that all who humble themselves and call upon the name of the Lord will be delivered or will be saved. And we also see in Amos uh, chapter 9, verse 11 to 15, we, we, we saw it today, saying that in the conclusion of Amos, well, he said that after the day of the Lord has judged Israel's evil, God would raise up the house of David, a message of hope, he's saying, and build a new kingdom for Israel and would include Edom and all the nations called by the name. And so the book of Obadiah has been placed right after Joel and then Amos to expand on these very promises that about the hope of God's kingdom over all nations. So the book, we see the book concludes with a very hopeful future saying that God says that he is going to restore his kingdom over the new Jerusalem so that he uh, repolluted it with faithful remnant. God's kingdom will expand to include all the territories and the nations around Israel. Yes, there's this message of hope that Obadiah says, Edom's downfall points to the day when God will deal with the evil in our world. But at the same time, he will also bring his healing towards a kingdom of peace over all the nation. And that's what the book of Obadiah is. And as we conclude this book, we also see the uh, Christ in this book. Christ is seen in Obadiah as the judge of the nation, as a savior of Israel and as the possessor of the kingdom. As we see this now, how do we apply this to ourselves? how we can apply the book of Obadiah, which comes as a strong uh, uh, strong message, though it may be small, but it carries a very strong message about, yes, God is judging the nation. God will put the uh, bring the pride to a downfall. But at the same time, God is merciful towards Israel. God is merciful not only to Israel, but towards all the nation, those who believe on the Son. Jesus. Now, Obadiah prophesies, focusing on the destructive power of pride. He reminds us the consequence of living in a self-serving manner. 
maybe you're following uh, uh, through on our own feeling and desires without considering the impact on those who are around us. So uh, do we sometimes struggle to set aside our own wants or desires for those of God and others? We need to look at that. Though um, such pride has been part of our lives of the fallen human being, which is there, well, Obadiah offers us a reminder to a place where ourselves under God's authority, subject our passion, our desire to his purpose, to find a hope in being his people when the restoration of all things comes. So with this, we need to be mindful of God. If there's uh, Obadiah is asking us to search within us, if there's any pride to uproot it out and seek God, because we will be save, saved. Uh, there is a blessing in humility. He's asking us to stay humble and be there to help others. And also the book of Amos says, be mindful of your neighbors. And here the, uh, the book of Obadiah says, stay humble. Stay humble as pride will bring you down. A very, very powerful message that we get from these two books. And we see some of the comparison between Amos and Obadiah that Amos lived at the same time as the other prophets, that is Hosea, Micah, and Isaiah. Well, Obadiah lived at the, at the same time as Jeremiah. There is a mistake here. Yeah. So... Uh, Amos emphasized God's righteous and sovereignty over history. And we see here Obadiah emphasized how much God hates the pride. And well, uh, yes, these are the two parts in the book of Obadiah. The first part, verse 1 to 14, talks about the accusation against the leaders of Edo. And then verse 15 to 21 talks about the day of the Lord is near against all nations. Ooh, ooh who destroyed Israel. And the reflection we have here is the prophecy of Obadiah speaks to us. Do we struggle with our pride? Do we, uh, are we suffering from our enemies around us? Our mens uh, do we have any time the situation or circumstance that we are in gave us a misconception about God? But then here it can be cleared. We should seek if there's anything, uh, any, any, uh, anything, is there anything within us that is prideful to be uprooted because pride will have a fall. God is asking us to be, stay humble in every area of our life. And he's also saying if you're suffering around, uh, if there's enemies around you and you're suffering because of them, do not worry because God himself is much greater in you and he will fight your battle. No weapon fashioned against you shall prosper because God himself is with you. You may look at everything is falling apart from, from you in your life, in your business, in your career, in any area. But then trust God that God will fight your battle. And those who trust God will never be put to shame. We need to place our trust in God, the God who was with Israel. He never gave up on Israel, no matter what. He stood, he restored them, he rebuilt them, he blessed them. The same way God will rebuild us, restore us, rebuild us, and bless us when we seek him. And yes, if there's any misconception about God, just get that clear, because that should be a priority of restoring our relationship with God. That should be a priority. Only when our relationship is restored with him, we can build it. We can have a good fellowship with God so that only through that, only through that relationship, we will have a victory. We will have a blessed life together with God. So with this, I end these two books, uh, the book of, uh, Obada, uh, book of Amos and the book of Obadiah. I'll open it to the class if you would like like to add, share, please go ahead. Class, is there anything that you would like to add or share?
Okay, so I understand that the book is clear. You understood. Everyone, Ruslan, you have anything to share? Divya, John, Brother Lubega? Um, nothing from my end. All good. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, yeah, it's clear. Okay, okay. Zeli, you would like to share something? Okay. Okay, uh, yes, it's clear. Great. Uh, so we can uh, dismiss this class with a word of prayer. Can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Rosalind, you will you will pray. I'll pray, Pastor. Okay, let's go ahead, John. Father, we want to thank you for this time you have given us to learn from your word, to understand how you dealt with the people of Israel in the Old Testament and helping us to understand how serious it is to uh, be very diligent in your presence, O oh God. And we pray that we would be able to continue in that attitude, O oh God. We pray that we would offer our life as a sacrifice before your presence and help us to honor you in every matter of our time, O oh God. We pray and submit all of us to your hands and help us to walk closely with you um, and to have an attitude of uh, thanksgiving in our hearts forever, Lord. Thank you for Pastor Diana. Thank you for enabling her, enabling, enabling her to share the word with us, Master. We give you praise and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. God bless. See you all tomorrow. Thanks. Bye.